Well, good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, today I want to cover this 1961 Hermes 3000 against the 1972 Hermes 3000. Stay tuned. Well, I purchased this uh, 1972 Hermes 3000. This is the French-made version, maybe the third style, the boxy square plastic style. I purchased this from Brown and Smith typewriters here in Albuquerque, oh goodness, 15 years ago maybe, uh, ostensibly for my uh, grandson. And then later on when he lost interest in it, I reacquired it and I've had it ever since. And more recently, just a couple weeks ago, I acquired this 1961 Hermes 3000, uh, thanks to my friend Bill Teft. And uh, so I recently covered this on a couple Facebook posts to the uh, Antique Typewriters group, but also I showed a little bit of the mechanics of this on a previous video last week talking about typewriter tools. And you saw me uh, trying out various bits on the Chapman typewriter tool set on this machine. So let's do a comparison between the two because there's a lot of discussion around is this earlier version of the Hermes 3000 better or worse than this version? Is this version better or worse than this version? Are they about the same? And that's a really good question and you don't often get the opportunity to compare both styles or both eras side by side, but here we are. We can do it. Stay tuned. Well, feature-wise, both machines appear virtually identical in terms of the kind of features they have and, in general, where the controls are laid out. And there's a lot of similarity between the way the parts are shaped in a lot of cases. But you'll see a few differences, like up on the carriage here. Things work the same. They may be shaped a little bit differently. Clearly, the bodies are different in material and shape. Uh, of course, the keyboard's a layout, uh, this is a standard American style with a newer uh, keyboard layout of the number one and an exclamation mark above it, where this is the older keyboard style that lacks the number one, but it also has some special order features. For instance, it has the, the square brackets, but it lacks the one quarter, one half fraction, but it does have a three quarter fraction. Uh, other than that, the layouts are pretty much identical. And the, the layouts of the function controls up here, your backspace, tab, and tabs, and margin release, they're all in the same location. They're just the buttons are different shaped. Well, the first thing you might notice is that the 1970s model, the carriage return lever, has kind of an angular shape to the handle compared to the 1961 model where the edges are rounder and uh, smoother, but other than that, they sit at about the same position above the ribbon cover. The angle of this bracket right here on the 1961 model is a little bit flatter, and it has this little raised molding here, whereas on the 1972 model, it has a sharp angle. It comes up like this. A little bit different shape right here. This has kind of a hollow bent look, whereas on the 1961 model, it has like a flange that goes into a slot on top of the uh, handle itself. The cover to the left carriage is rounded and has these kind of smooth transitions here, whereas on the 1972 version it's more angular, slightly different shape, but you can see the same general layout here between the two. And of course the controls are in the same place. You have the carriage release button, the margin setting button, and the platen knobs on both models in the same location. The knobs, however, are a different style. On the 1972, it has these kind of serrated little grooves, and it's a, a slightly tapered, conically tapered outwards with a hollow molding in the middle, whereas the earlier version has knurled grooves along the edge and more of a domed out, smooth appearance. The later version, the top of this uh, panel is more flat and it still has the same molded markings for one, one and a half, and two. Whereas the earlier version, the shape of the cover kind of rounds down and then it has molded markings for one, one and a half, and two, but they're painted. The grooves are actually painted, so these are, uh, grooves are cut into the plastic and painted versus these are raised markings. And you might also notice the paper bale bracket on the 1970s version has an angle right here, a sharp angle, 
whereas on the 1960s it sort of has a continuous round here. But the front side of the paper bale looks very similar in both cases. The front bracket that has the floating uh, margin indicator and the bale rollers themselves look identical between both models. This um, version has the ribbon floating uh, flying margin ribbon indicator intact. This version, that ribbon system is missing. It's just part of the condition of this machine. You can see the clearance here between the bottom of the carriage return lever and the ribbon cover. It's a good amount of clearance. Whereas on the earlier version, it has a rather tight, much tighter clearance. In fact, there is some scratching that's happened on this ribbon cover because this bracket was a little wobbly due to the lack of washers on the mounting point inside there. So there's more of a chance this is going to be scratched up if you find one of these models. On the rear panel where the paper fingers are, you can see on the later version there's a sharp band right here and then it, the panel goes vertical. Whereas on the earlier version it just makes a continuous smooth round transition to vertical right here with no obvious crease. The paper fingers though, on both of these, they function very similarly but they are slightly different in shape. On the earlier version the fingers are continuously rounded, whereas on the later version it's obvious that the fingers are angular, much more angular. And there's also some molding here where the fingers recess into the rear panel on the later version, whereas on the earlier version they kind of just sit there behind the machine and they follow the contour of the rear panel. So on the right side of the carriage we see similar functions with just slightly slight differences in the uh, shape of things. Now the condition of my machine here there is a crack running through the plastic panel here on the 1972 version but you can see the controls are basically in the same position as the earlier version. The earlier version this panel is made of metal and of course the differences in the knob styling is also evident. Both uh, machines have this raised little curved piece that sort of helps you with your get your finger in there I think to help raise the uh, paper bale. They're both the same way here and they both have the same system of uh, carriage lock. The knobs are a little bit different shape. This one is more squarish where this one has a more round appearance to it. The controls on the front are very much in the same positions uh, on both machines. You have the touch selector, you have the backspace key, the tab set and clear key, the tab all clear key, margin release key, and the tab button itself, and then the bichrome setting or trichrome setting in this case up there. And on the 1970s version they're in exactly the same position, that just the control switches are slightly different shaped. Uh, on the case of the bichrome or trichrome setting the colors are recessed in, to the left of the knob itself, whereas on the earlier version there are little painted dots on, they're actually raised dots on the front side of the panel. I like the shape of the space bar and uh, the keys in general on the earlier version. The 1970s version, it seems that the space bar has this openness on the bottom. It's thinner and it reveals more of the underneath part of the machine. I don't really like the shape of it as much. The keys are very similar in shape, however, but you can see they're made of two different kinds of plastic as the space bar has yellowed a lot more than the keys themselves have. And of course, the uh, function keys up on the back row are more squarish or rectangular compared to the function keys on the earlier version. I should mention if you're curious, these two green brackets here in here, these were add-on brackets that I, I installed along with these two feet here because uh, this machine had been glued uh, permanently together. The top and the bottom body halves had been glued together because the plastic clips that hold the bottom to the top had broken at one time and probably Mr. Brown at Brown and Smith had glued these together after he serviced it 
once I uh, broke the glue joints apart in order to clean this up, the top piece would just rattle as you typed and I needed a way of clamping them together. So I drilled a hole in the bottom, installed these feet with bolts and these two green brackets to hold it together. And that's my little makeshift way of repairing that problem. The touch control on the later version indicates from one to four, whereas on the earlier version it has four positions but they're not numbered. You raise it up to make the touch heavier. So ignoring my green bracket add-on, you might notice that both machines have this recessed opening to either side of the space bar, but the earlier version also has this bracket on either side. These brackets are for two different styles of lid latching. So this uh, style is the later style of lid latch. The latch on the lid engages these grooves. This particular model was a transitional point in the, the first uh, version of the Hermes 3000. The earlier style of lid latch, which this machine uses, uses this bracket, but then a later style lid, the middle range of these body styles would also fit into this groove here. Here you can see the linkage on the lid system. There's a push button that causes this to move. This is the earlier style. The corresponding place where it engages is going to be this rear bracket right here. Whereas on the later version, there is a sliding lever on the right side of the grip that slides these two brackets sideways to engage the recessed holes on either side of the space bar. On the later body style, to remove the ribbon cover, you pull up on the front of the cover like that and pull it off. Whereas on the earlier version, you pull up on the rear of the cover toward the front and these two fingers here disengage on the front here to remove the panel. In the early 60s version, the ribbon reversing system has this bracket that's inboard of the ribbon spool with kind of a wire bent shaped uh, guide that the ribbon threads through and it pivots back and forth like that. And there is notably a, a set of springs here and over here, of course, also for that uh, reversing system. Whereas by the time you get to the 1970s, the bracket is changed from the wire style to this bent flat style. And that whole bracket with the spring loaded mechanism is no longer evident uh, above here. It's uh, di a slightly different mechanism that's underneath. On the earlier version, the type guide is all chrome plated and this plate here is the same on both. But one noticeable difference is on the earlier style here, the segment area right here is flat, right? It's machined flat. Compare that to the 1970s version, where now the type guide area, while it's chrome plated on the guides themselves, the uh, bracket underneath is not. This plate appears to be the same, but a real notable difference is this segment area now is cast or machined to be curved. Here you can see the profile of the segment area on the 1970s version. And what I think this does is I think it gives superior support to the type arms, the type bars as they move. There's more support area for them, probably making them a little bit more secure, a little bit less likely to bend or have variation in a lateral position. Versus the earlier style where you can see the grooves would be flatter or, or shallower. You don't have that bulge up here that supports the type bars better as, it's, uh, as, as the type bar is flying up to the print position. So what's interesting is this might be one case where the later version of this design was probably improved a little bit. Yeah, I actually think that this design here gives the type bars a little bit more support as it's moving up. And that's an interesting observation that instead of the usual idea of quality decreasing over time, they might have actually improved the design over time. Having said that, however, there are other areas where the older design may be better. And here's one example is the thick felt sound insulation. It's almost an inch thick, probably maybe two centimeters thick. Very impressive kind of sound insulation, and it wraps all the way around to almost the space bar area here. Whereas on the 1970s version, there's really no sound insulation at all. It's just hollow in there. Oddly enough, there's plenty of room for felt, and in fact, a person could probably install some felt between uh, the uh, plastic shell and the chassis, and I think it would fit fine. 
So here's an example of where different styles of controls essentially do the same thing. This is the touch control on the earlier version. It's a piece of chrome plated metal that projects out and really all it's doing is pulling on this spring down in here various degree. You can see the top of the spring right there. So it's just providing a various degrees of pre-tensioning to the universal bar. Whereas in the 1970s version, it's a plastic knob and it just has a series of detents on this metal bracket that hold it in place, but it's basically doing the same thing. It's simply pulling a spring, pre-tensioning the universal bar via a spring. Same function, different style controls. One other difference in the ribbon systems is the newer version has these spring-loaded arms that keep the supply spool more tense. It provides back tension on the supply spool, whereas the earlier version doesn't have those arms. The support pad for the type bars at the rest position is this thick piece of rubber that's kind of spongy feeling. Whereas on the later 1970s version, it's a thinner piece of harder rubber. It's not so spongy, it's harder. Both machines look like they have the same style of clear plastic card guide. There's an adjustment screw here that enables you to slide each guide laterally on a groove. Here is the later version. You can see they're basically the same style of card guide. Well, it's kind of a totally non-scientific experiment. Let's see how loud the typewriters sound. I'm going to hold my lav mic roughly above the space bar in the middle, and I'm just going to type uh, maybe some middle characters on the top row, the, the TYU. Let's go here and see what it sounds like. And the same experiment on the 1970s version. Okay, so now I have the microphone right between both machines. I have both machines angled about the same distance toward each other. This gives me a little room on the uh, carriage return lever and they, so they won't hit each other up here. So I'm just going to type an alternating um, set of characters. The same, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll type on opposite sides of the keyboard. I'll start at the Q here and the P here and I'll, I'll type from Q to P and P to Q coming in toward the middle. So each key is the same distance from the microphone, okay? Here we go. They sound very similar to me in terms of loudness. I don't really hear any difference. Let's try from the L to the A. They sound the same as far as the sound or the noise, which is interesting. What's interesting about the sound of the machines is <clears throat> this body style has a lot more sound insulation in it, but it doesn't really sound any quieter than the later version. And maybe because its body panels are made of metal and the metal might transmit sound a little better versus the later body panel being made of plastic, it probably doesn't transmit the sound quite as loudly. It's very possible that one of the reasons why they went to this body style, certainly not the only one, because it was a stylistic thing going from the rounded 60s look or late 50s look to the 70s look. One of the reasons might have been, besides cost savings and style, it could have been they didn't have to put the felt in this newer machine. It was just intrinsically quieter because of the materials used. So this earlier machine, this particular one is 13 character per inch approximately. The later machine is an 11 character per inch, sort of the intermediate between Pika and Elite. Uh, let's do some typing and compare the typefaces. They are different. So there is the typeface on the older machine. The alignment of the characters isn't perfect. I think my A is a little low, but uh, it's a pretty good typeface, nice typeface, small. So this typewriter has a sans serif typeface. Nice and modern looking and it's approximately 11 characters per inch. It's actually a metric, but in imperial measurements it's about 11 per inch. I think subjectively both of these typewriters feel about the same. When you set it to the same touch setting, this they are 
almost identical, which is interesting because the 1961 version I have is like two generations prior to the 1972 version. Uh, so they maintained a really good sense of consistency in the typing experience between both machines. And I found that pretty impressive, actually. Now, whether you prefer the Hermes 3000 Touch is an entirely different story. And it really has to do with your preference for firm, crisp action versus a little bit of a softer action. I, I tend to think that, like, if you compare Olympia's Hermes 3000s and let's say Olivetti's, I tend to think that they would be ordered Olympia Hermes Olivetti from crisp to softer touch. And I really think the Hermes 3000 has a really good blend of crisp action, but a kind of a soft finish, not so hard, not so demanding on your fingers. And I really do think that's one of the reasons why they're so highly sought after. Their touch really is pretty darn good. Now as for the question of whether you prefer the 1960s curvy version or the 1970s plastic boxy version, I think more people are going to prefer the curvy version. But you might find it easier to locate a 1970s version at maybe a less expensive price just because it's not so highly sought after while at the same time it has almost identical construction and really about the same touch and typing experience. So I really think the 1970s version is maybe the better value in this market of highly inflated Hermes 3000 prices, the so-called cult of Hermes. You might also find the, in this case, 11 years that separate these two machines. The platen on this newer machine is distinctly softer and more resilient than on the 11 year older machine. That might be another reason to look for the plastic boxy version actually. There are some condition differences between these two machines. Of course, every typewriter has its own unique history. There's 11 years separating them in age and a world of difference perhaps in their, in their usage. Um, so I won't really go into the differences in condition really. Uh, that's not gonna inform you when you go out to buy one, except to know that in general, these are gonna be newer obviously than these. There's a chance they might be in better shape but not always. As far as overall design, um, I think I like the touch, the feel, the relative quiet of both machines. What's amazing about these machines is that despite their difference, two generations separating them, they have very, very similar noise levels, touch, really almost identical as far as the differences are really about sample variation from one version to another. They're really very close. The Shape and length and position of the carriage return levers are very similar. I think you'll find on the 1970s version, the carriage return lever probably sits slightly higher than the 19, early 60s version. Um, the one thing I don't really like as much about the design of either one is the paper fingers system up here. You know, they're bent backwards or curved backwards, and they're not gonna really support your paper upright. It's more of just keeping the paper as it drapes backwards, keeping it from dragging on the table surface is really the whole point of this. I think one of the big things I don't really like about the system is the flying ribbon indicator, the red band. Obviously the one in this typewriter is missing probably because the ribbon just rotted out. And if you look and see how that ribbon is threaded around the little pulleys and goes underneath it and back here, and there's a spring that connects the two halves of the ribbon, it's a really complicated system, very much overly complicated. And also, the experience I had in working on this machine, I took apart the entire paper bale, and the way the bale itself is connected to the brackets is a very, very thin slot that is kind of difficult to get connected on both sides. You have to kind of fiddle with the tiny screws to get this bale to catch the brackets. And so it's kind of a um, 
marginal design. I don't really like it as much as some of the other machines. I just think it's overly engineered and poorly built. That's one of the few things I can criticize though about this machine overall. And maybe the other thing uh, that's probably a fair criticism is the carriage release button versus the margin setting button. I think this design is just very poor because you want to instinctively, if you're familiar with any other manual typewriter, you want to instinctively grab this lever back here thinking it's the carriage release and it's not, it's the margin setting. And if you grab it and, and pull it, you're going to set the margin blink, back to wherever your print position currently is located. And so uh, it's just not very intuitive to have to push a button in like this to move the carriage. And that's uh, one of the other quirks about the machine, maybe the only other true criticism I have of it. But if you can live with with those limitations and live with the potential high cost and scarcity of finding one of these in good shape at a reasonable price, then you might really enjoy your typing experience on a Hermes 3000. Again, I think these two are very, very similar in sound, touch, and overall typing experience. The real differences are aesthetic and age differences. That's my review, basically, of these two eras of Hermes 3000. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. Please drop a comment. Let's have a dialogue about it. And as always, I wish you guys the very best. Stay healthy, stay well, stay creative. And until next time, have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.